Greetings. It's uh, nice to see everybody in the house. Thank you for coming over. In case you don't know who I am, I'm Tim DeNoble. I'm Dean of the College of Architecture, Planning, and Design. Are we getting feedback here? A little bit. So I'm pleased today to, uh, to welcome you to the Lee A. Bryant Memorial Lecture on Art and Architecture, which honors 1970 architecture alumnus Lee Bryant, who died of a stroke in 1981 at the age of 40. The lecture series is a living tribute to Bryant's passion for art and a fitting means for sharing with future generations of students his concern for the vital interaction of art and architecture. We are honored to host uh, David Lewis of Lewis, Suramaki and Lewis of New York City this, uh, this afternoon. And you've probably read the bio, but as you uh, likely know, that was a firm that was founded in 1997. Um, he is also an associate professor at Parsons the new school of design in the school of constructed environments, um, where he directed the design workshop program from 07 through uh, 10, and uh, on the faculty of the Solar Decathlon House uh, project in 2011, and served as an interim dean for one year uh, from 2012 to 2013, and I, um, I'm jealous of him for being able to do that for one year. Um, so, uh, uh, as a way of introduction, many of you uh, have, have heard uh, uh, that I have often spoken of the long and wonderful tradition of drawing and sketching embedded in this college. And as many of you may recall, I have stressed that our graphic musings and representations are more than a means to an end, but often achieve great value as artifacts in and of themselves. Uh, we, we, in that regard, we take great pride uh, in, in, in our drawings and in our sketches. It is appropriate that David Lewis comes to us as the 2014 Bryant Lecture, uh, in that one only need to look at the incredible artifacts of analog and digital, or analog with digital, investigations completed in designing and investigating their work to realize there and his passion for the art of and for architecture and also for maintaining a practice as they said in their book rooted in a curiosity around the world in this case perhaps best investigated through the hand so with that i give you david lewis it's a great pleasure to have you here thank you Thanks, Tim. Um, thank you all for this, uh, this invitation. I'm going to try to stay away from that microphone so I don't get the feedback. Um, it's, I mean, the, the issue of drawing for us is really critical, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm able to sort of begin with that introduction because it's a way of thinking about how we engage uh, practice. And we, we, we do this very much in a collaborative format, uh, one in which all, all three principals are involved in all aspects of the, of the projects. We uh, share a collaborative environment, which you see here in the studio. Uh, one associate, a number of design, uh, designers, uh, part of our staff, and only one support staff, uh, working in an open studio environment. And we intentionally take on a pretty wide range of work, and those include interiors, installations, more traditional buildings or architecture projects, as well as more speculative work, some that's self-generated, some that's more research-based. But in each of these, and this is for us what's really critical, is the ability to, to keep a kind of consistent methodology and the methodology for us is really rooted in thinking through uh, the givens of any project. In other words, instead of ignoring the constraints of a project, we really see a uh, given constraints, whether it's budget, site, time, uh, the material conditions, as in fact the very catalyst by which the best projects come about. Uh, to do that, we really we see our design process, what we refer to as invention sprawl. Um, we like to uh, say, well, what if you did this? And then raise a question about that. So what if you do of something else? And then you build from that, and you sprawl to something that you hadn't anticipated through a completely logical process. You can trace your way back, but one you can't anticipate the end from the beginning. 
So it's a, it's a much more open-ended spe speculative way of thinking that does involve the uh, working back and forth between hand, visual means of making, as well as working uh, with physical fabrication. Um, toward that end, we try to see projects or aspects of all projects have what, what we call multivalent performance. In other words, we never see uh, one thing only doing one uh, function. Uh, a room we tend to see not just serving one need, but serving as many things as possible. And having the material, spatial, light conditions of that, of that architecture do as much as possible in as limited means, both as uh, conserve resources, but also usually extend the budget. Um, it also deals with what we see as, a, in some ways, one of the real challenges or opportunities, I should say, of architecture, which is to uh, intensify social relationships, which is the title of the talk. Um, and this is coming about in part because of kind of challenges and changes that are occurring within contemporary tech, uh, technology and culture from digital media, in which you have eight best friends all gathering together so they can go on Facebook, um, as exemplified in this. Or riders on a subway, completely oblivious of what's happening around them. There's no sense of the environment, no sense of the world. Um, or even, you know, uh, bike riders having to uh, you know, uh, confront a, someone texting standing in the middle of the bike lane. Um, so you get this sort of uh, a transformed relationship to the environment around you by the means in which the social media acts for a different kind of material engagement. It's not to say that, it, that I'm decrying social media by any means. It simply it shifts the value by which architecture not only is understood, but also has an opportunity to really transform, to see it as a kind of catalyst for for face-to-face -face physical human interaction that I think architecture has the capacity now to really engage in a way that offsets some of the negative consequences of social media. Um, as you can see here in sort of uh, domestic settings, this is modern family, so it's a snapshot, um, or in the second inauguration of the Obama presidency in which they're all tweeting, I think. Um, um, on the other hand, and this is to make sure that this is not a kind of negative critique of social media per se, uh, things like uh, Occupy Wall Street could only occur because of the capacity to be able to exchange information so quickly. In fact, one of the first things they did was to set up a media camp so that you can produce this kind of social interaction, but one that is unique as opposed to every day. And what we're interested in in our work is how to transform everyday spaces, spaces that you use on a continual basis, through the qualities of architecture, both interior, exterior, material, light, space, and sound, to really activate and intensify the relationships between humans. Right? I'll give you an example, a really clear example, um, uh, it, within the University of Wyoming. Is it possible, by any chance, to drop some of the house lights by? Yeah, I'm to keep it okay. All right. All right. Um, we can even go black. I think there'll be, you know, plenty of light off the screen. Um, so this, this was the existing conditions of the project, the University of Wyoming. Not exactly the space you'd want to hang out. All right. Um, and our challenge was to completely transform this into a center uh, for uh, student learning within a, a, a school for education, um, yet still keep the existing interior building frame, the, uh, the coordinate, the circulation. You have a double height space, but this is really the kind of given uh, conditions of a relatively new building. Um, our challenge was to say, well, well, how can't we use the kind of typical conditions of a cloister, courtyard, and a picture gallery? Uh, and join those together by inserting, paradoxically, uh, smaller spaces into this large space to produce greater social interaction, so that you'd effectively create a courtyard and then run a picture gallery around the outside, so what was a, an undifferentiated space in the middle now becomes a much more heightened space, and orchestrate it through one primary material, namely a bamboo screen, so that the screen would activate to both, it, both define the interior but through the different opacities, both on the first floor and the second floor, the ability to sort of glimpse in, to see what's happening inside that lounge that we created, uh, whether through larger windows or through smaller windows, as well as to keep the outside, essentially, picture windows, so you'd have activity going around on the outside where you'd have stasis on the inside, so you'd be able to manage the different functional relationships, but now sort of doing as much as possible within that given space as you can, so that you view through from the inside back out to the picture galleries through the same, same view uh, corridors and get the sense of the big wall uh, beyond. Um, as a result, you end up producing spaces, lounges, where people want to gather, where there's a chance to really have a kind of one-to-one -one conversation, to study, to meet in a group of about 20, 25 on both first floor and the second floor, 
um, but united through the architectural conditions. In this case, pointing to this question of multivalent performance, trying to do as many things as possible with a given condition so that the very structure for the bamboo is the very thing that sponsors the new light that as it slides up off of the ceiling becomes the new handrail, the, the support for the handrail up above. So essentially trying to link these things as much as possible so that they're not just individual element, but there's a synthetic condition between the material properties of different functional components all orchestrated into a singular unified uh, condition to serve, in this case, the light, but ultimately to serve the kind of social construction of the space itself. In addition to that, we had a very large wall, which you see here, double height space wall. And we realized that you couldn't just, you know, paint it white. You had to do something here that, that would magnify the light that's coming from the skylight of above, but also reference the fact that this was in uh, uh, the state of Wyoming. So what we did was we hired uh, a digital fabrication company to work with us to do effectively through a series of really oversized panels uh, the world's largest single topographic map relief map of the state of Wyoming. Um, so uh, accentuating the z-axis, I believe by 15 to 20 percent off of the x and y, so that when you're sitting here, people can actually say, oh, that's where I vacation, that's where I'm actually from. So it becomes a kind of uh, point of conversation, but it's also a point of conversation that refers back to the actual site and location, the state and its uh, particular well-known topography and geology. For, for other projects, in this case the universe, uh, for uh, Art House at the Jones Center in, in Austin, Texas, uh, we were given a very different challenge. Equally uh, from the standpoint of a kind of social life or the role of Art House at the Jones Center, which was a contemporary art center without a permanent collection, um, that wanted to take, make the most of a building that they had uh, been using for a number of years that had a really particularly interesting history. So our challenge was to update it to be a contemporary uh, art center, but at the same time reflect the historical tradition of the building that we were given. It had originally been a theater, as you see here, had been transformed in the 1950s into a department store, and when Art House took it over, it essentially had essentially a Russian drawl set of constructions. It was both a, a concrete frame of the original um, uh, uh, theater building and a steel insertion within it, um, and we saw our role as adding a series of tactical additions on top of it not just whitewashing, getting rid of the history, but you know, adding to the kind of trajectory of build-outs and transformations of the ex existing building, so that if this is what we found, this is what we transformed it into. Keeping some of the conditions, but pulling them forward. One of the real challenges of the project was that it, it's a contemporary gallery, so the interior need to be kept relatively dark, but the largest single wall facing on 7th and Congress, uh, south by southwest occurs primarily a block south, um, that this south facing wall is the dominant piece, but if you just paint it white, it would just be left white. It has no image, no icon, no capacity to be able to resonate to the rest of the town that this was Art House, a, a significant anchor within the downtown uh, rejuvenated art scene. So what we did was realize, okay, here's an opportunity. We need to be able to minimize the amount of light, so the constraints of the project, we need to minimize the amount of light, but we also wanted to activate the southern light and make it part of the delight of the building. So how do you do this? What we thought was going to be really interesting was to take blocks, essentially uh, glass blocks, insert them into the wall so that they become essentially shadow casting devices that in the morning rake across the facade uh, and mark the facade. But more importantly, we organize them within the facade, not just as a grid, but according to where the light could be used, the studios, the offices. So effectively, the outside wall becomes a palimpsest or a sort of marker of the interior function of the, of, of the program. Um, on the inside, then, it becomes yet another mark in the history of the trajectory of this building. So here you can see the legacy of the theater um, within the uh, essentially decoration, uh, residual decoration, the uh, department store in its yellow steel that gets inserted, and then our insertions as these glass blocks to try to pull in light off that south side. In the artist studios, even more light to amplify daylight, and up in the main uh, Piano Noble or the main gallery, where you could see the traces of where it used to be the old uh, uh, amphitheater going down to the stage. Um, less uh, glass blocks, less light, so they can be closed off pretty quickly by the curators or left open to produce the unusual consequences of light going through a square producing a prismatic field. Uh, this is not Photoshop, so it has that kind of quality. All of this, of course, produces on the outside an incredible raking, a sort of marking an image of the building 
that was done by a six foot two guy with a chainsaw. All right. So you know, here's where the material qualities of architecture come, come into the kind of idea of what you're doing. You're essentially having to cut around the different structures that are there in which we literally did a full scale drawing on the wall marking precisely working with a structural engineer to ensure that we could cut where we needed to cut and then run uh, essentially these blocks. Each of these blocks are essentially four inches by 12 inches and they vary in depth from about a foot to almost four feet long depending on how long they had to go through the thickness of the wall. All right? They're just straight annealed glass uh, laminated up, um, so great uh, green glass that then uh, you can see in more detail here tapered at the top uh, so that they would deal with a kind of drainage condition. Um, and then uh, working with Lumen uh, Architects, the lighting consultant, to be able to tie a five-point LED, which is then triggered through a Cat5 and powered through a Cat5 cable, which we had to run through, so that each of the blocks could not only work in daylight, but at night becomes essentially the sign of the building. E they're computer controlled, so you can actually turn them into the, what we were really happy to be proud, proud to say that this is probably the world's largest light bright installation. Um, so that someone can turn it on, script it in terms of uh, lighting at night, working as part of the choreography of the street. Um, these are the drawings we, we do. They're not just representations. They're actually they're highly constructed. And for us, it's really important that the construction of the drawings, working between hand and digital, is not that dissimilar from the actual construction. Right? It's not a kind of rendering to convince the client and then you actually build something different. Right? It's really constructing the logic of the project so that we can do these without too much the trouble with the before and after. Um, and in this case, you can see the kind of the lights illuminated and then uh, a very the old picture window that the department store had now turned into the screen for the movie projection room behind. And in this case, an uh, artist was uh, hired uh, to do a video about Art House in which they actually showing Art House on the screen of Art House um, after a nuclear apocalypse. Um, so that's what it will look like after a nuclear apocalypse, according to the artist. Um, on the inside, the challenge is how do you make the most of, uh, of what you're, what, what, where we were doing, going to put in new construction, in this case, the ceiling. So the ceiling becomes a point in which it's not just an acoustic ceiling, but it becomes something you can hang art from. Each of the holes become uh, speakers. They become sprinklers. They take on all the kind of uh, requirements that the ceiling increasingly has to do to be able to mediate all the kind of material mechanical, plumbing, electrical conditions, as well as the acoustic conditions of the project. Um, by making this, however, all white, we could call attention to this, because it gets at one of the challenges of the project, which is the main gallery space is up on the second floor. This is all at the street, open and transparent to the street to draw people in, but you want to then draw them back up through the stairs so they could see the exhibition. So, what we did was en it ended up inserting the one colored piece, the one figure that, uh, that becomes a kind of icon that draws your attention. It also pulls you immediately to the front desk so that the front desk is actually where an extension of the tread of the wood stair. So that when you go to get your ticket, you're actually almost already on the stairs being pulled and clearly identified as to where you're going to go. These aren't just treads, they're actually part of the skylight. So that during the day, daylight pulls down through, rakes across the treads, and each of these treads or, or sides are set at an angle required by code that a nosing of, uh, of a stair has to extend out beyond. So that the angle of the marking is actually coming from code requirements set forth by uh, conditions of building the stair in the first place. Um, the stair pieces themselves are all uh, essentially laminated up wood that had to be brought in by the contractor before the building was closed up because they were so large. Uh, and you can see that this was not the easiest thing to do for the contractor. Because um, uh, they're pinned one location there and another location like giant uh, hockey sticks. Um, these are all photographs by Michael Moran. Uh, uh, and one of the key things that we're, uh, I want to acknowledge him because they're photographs of architecture intentionally done to be able to capture the idea, in this case, the connection between the stair tread and the desk as marked uh, all the way across here. Um, when you pull up into the, into the main gallery floor, uh, the challenge is often what do you, how, how do you make this gallery floor as, uh, as useful as possible? Um, what, do you, what do you do to deal with the kind of uh, complexities of different programmatic conditions? They're gonna have changing exhibitions. They don't have a permanent show. So what we realized was that we were having to put in new steel to support 
uh, the structure of the roof because we're going to build an occupiable deck on top. By putting in new steel, we could actually now have new tracks to build a single giant wall that through motorized systems could go from a wall, a space with two white walls divided with a with very simple push of a button so it slides across. Uh, another push of the button in about 15 seconds can di divide the space in half or can be produced to the pure white gallery. So it could do this and adjust to whatever the needs were, producing maximum flexibility with a minimum number of means because of the need to be able to minimize the amount of maintenance down the line. Okay. Furthermore, we realize, and this is the, in the op shot from the opening exhibition where they set this up as a sound corridor. Um, by, by essentially putting in a new deck up here, we could clear out all the HVAC that would have been in here so that this gets uh, uh, opened up again, keeping the historic uh, system, moving uh, effect effectively all that HVAC out of the way into the sort of uh, poche space and creating a new public room, essentially a living room for the city um, uh, out of timber that can double as a movie theater in the evenings, uh, particularly after the sun sets and it's actually much more temperate to go outside. Um, during the day, a, a place to stop to read, um, and then in the evening, a place to gather. And this has now become you know, a key uh, piece within downtown Austin, uh, a nightlife piece, a, a place for bands to play, a place for art openings, essentially an extension of the social mission of Art House to really draw people into the downtown and to turn the building into a catalyst for this kind of activity. And for us, is what's really great is to be able to see this kind of thing happening, um, not only up top, but also the way in which the, the layout of the first floor sets up a sort of incredibly interesting condition because of the transparency that already existed from the department store, where we could turn this front lobby into effectively a, 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 an extension, almost a, a transparent extension of the sidewalk. Um, and in opening night, they were afraid that it was going to rain, so they moved the band from the roof down to this space, which I think was actually uh, made one of some of the, the nicest moments, and I'll play this video. So you can see all these people out here just kind of trying to figure out what's going on. There's this really interesting tension between the inside and outside, between the city, uh, between the program, going to the heart of what Art House wanted to do, which was to effectively create a vibrant downtown through the transformation of this existing building, um, and doing so through the role of architecture. This is a, a very different scale project, but it has a similar, similar intent, um, which is to say that uh, it, it, when you work as an architect, you have the capacity to really sculpt space. But we've also been asked to do art or more installation-based pieces. Um, but we approach it from the same manner. In this case, this is a Memorial Sloan Kettering's lobby wall. Uh, it was a building designed by SOM. They knew they were going to put a lobby art piece at that location. It was designated uh, between this floor, which is at 68, uh, a throughway to 69th uh, for a research um, building. So the first thing we did was instead of designing what we thought the art was going to be, we just figured, well, where are people going to be? Where, how, how is this wall going to be seen? Can we use the very con conditions of a lobby, entrance, movement, sequence, passage as the very generator of the piece itself. So we mapped in plan people and in section people, uh, took those people as they were, they were stationary based upon a kind of idealized density where we thought people would go, um, projected them onto this given lobby wall location as a series of cones um, so that they effectively, you know, what, what happens if everyone is looking at this from different st st station points within the given lobby? Um, this then produces a kind of geometric uh, moment, which is the cone, when it hits a wall on the oblique, produces an, a, a kind of elliptical condition. And we thought, well, this could be actually pretty fascinating. What happens if we take all of these uh, viewpoints, map them, push them across, and now start doing them with the thickness of the wall so that the front, while regular in terms of setting up a series of rules, produces the back that looks like it's completely illogical. Um, and then the thickness of the inside can be the sort of space between all these cones as they interact or intersect within that wall. Um, so here is our, our, our drawing, uh, because it, it, it demonstrates uh, to the client the idea that you would have this wall, it would have an interior, it would fit within the space, and then it would have moments like this where you would realize you're occupying 
the space in the lobby by which the cone was originally set up against the wall. And that's also great, and we said, well, we could make that out of boxes. It turned out to be about 526 boxes uh, for roughly about 260 uh, cone views. And then the challenge was, how do you build these things? Um, in a digital model, it works perfectly well because everything kind of stands up when you do an intersection, a Boolean intersection, um, between cones and solids. But when you actually start analyzing it, you get boxes that are really good, gray, which you can see up at the top, boxes that have two sides that are supported, these two sides are taken away. Here, little tabs that are left over, even more tabs, and my favorite, fantasy, you know, floating bits of digital ether, a little hard to hold up. So every one of these purple boxes and every one of the red boxes had to be recalibrated by relocating the cone, reinserting the kind of uh, script to then figure out how we can get 100% perfect boxes, because you can't build that. Um, then we worked with a fabricator in Philadelphia called Vaco to essentially digitally cut this. They build a jig out of aluminum so it could work as a heat sink because they, they realized the only way we could build this to really be about the cones, not about the boxes and how they do or do not line up is if we work with zero tolerance. There could be no tolerance in the difference between one box and the next. So they had to do continual linear weld. The only way to do it on stainless steel bead blasted. So they built this jig so that what effectively when you weld a side, it then shrinks back onto the jig. The aluminum pulls the heat out, and then they had to essentially build a jack that would jackhammer each of the boxes off so they could actually pull it off the jig. All right. um, so one guy basically spent a year making these boxes, doing about 1.8 miles of linear uh, stainless steel welding, then bead blasted, uh, painted on the inside, so these are in the process, painted fluorescent matte yellow, so it would bounce around as much light as possible, um, grouped into different uh, clumps because they had to be brought into the city of New York City in the middle of this building actually being operated, um, hauled by a series of installations. So this is not lightweight by any means. It's you know, a bunch of guys with massive cranes holding these things into place uh, to clip them around the steel columns, which you can see here, so that you can effectively get an effect at the end of the installation of a seamless taut surface. All right, that uh, opens up at different moments, such as here from the front, um, and then from the street, calls your attention and eye past the, the, the front entrance. Uh, for us, what's interesting is how this actually activates as you walk around it. So not only do the boxes open up, but you have the capacity to be able to start seeing holes. Where, where, are the, where is the cone taken from? So if effectively what happens is the, instead of looking at the sculpture, the sculpture actually looks back at you. It's the thing that identifies where you are. It, it, it identifies your subjectivity at this, at this location on the front, and then as you work around to the back. And then as you come up the back, the ramp in the back, what ends up happening is the, the, the seamless thing, totally rational, gridded on the front, breaks down entirely, front, back, so that you create a kind of interior landscape that was unanticipated by the process. In other words, it was impossible to actually design what these spaces would look like, that become kind of a Piranesian interiority that is the resultant of a absolutely, totally practical, logical structure. All right? So this is what I mean by the kind of invention sprawl. You set up a series of processes that ends up with something you hadn't anticipated, but it's, but it's part of trying to get this lobby piece not just to be plop art, but to engage the social life and the activation of the lobby in and of itself. In a, in a very different project, the challenge of the social was made absolutely apparent. And this is for Gallaudet University for a competition that we won to do as a design build working with a, with a contractor, uh, Seagull Construction, uh, with, in partnership with Quinn Evans Architects. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Gallaudet University is the oldest uh, uh, university dedicated to the education of the deaf, now bilingual, American Sign Language. And we were asked to do a building according to deaf space standards. And those are standards set up by Gallaudet themselves for what are the spatial expectations for building a building that will serve, not just serve the deaf, but actually will answer to the deaf's unique ability to understand spatial conditions because they see and experience the world, particularly the world of architecture constructed in a completely unique way. One that is very much driven by lines of communication as diagrams here, and these are all diagrams from Gallaudet that gave us as part of the competition, in which walking is, you, can, uh, you have to be absolutely conscious of not only where your sight lines are as you're signing to someone, but you can't put any obstructions in front, 
and you can't have tiny little sidewalks where the fourth person in the conversation is going to get hit by a car, right? Because then they won't see the car coming, right? Because they'll be concentrating on the conversation. Um, and social spaces that reinforce this sense of community through an activation of section-based sight lines. So these are the conditions that we were given for the project to build a living and learning center, essentially a residence hall with a very large social space that would not only meet the deaf space, but actually exceed them to produce a living community. And our approach was to really recognize that the security needs mean, meant that the upper levels had to be living, the lower levels needed to be a learning, and that learning should really activate and make a relationship between inside and outside so that we would dispose and use glass to maximize interior exterior relationships so that you could have at the public level here, all the way through here, and at the large public lounges, a capacity to not only see but to communicate across that, uh, that the, the uh, enclosure threshold. Um, um, down below, the very large, we had to negotiate uh, about six feet drop in terrain, so we turned this sort of walkway into a kind of extension of a walkway on the inside, so that as you're walking up, you'll actually be able to see and look out into the lounge space, which is part of the main quad of Gallaudet itself, so here a frontal, frontal view, uh, showing that kind of condition between a transparency at the lower level for the public and less transparent where you have the rooms up above. Um, the Organization, though, of the building, this is one of the challenges of doing a 60,000 square foot building for about 173 beds, is how do you, how do you not make it institutional? Um, how do you break the scale down? And we did so by looking at a series of three bars. And you can see them here. Two, one central bar out of brick, a front bar facing onto the quad, uh, clad in uh, slate, and then a back bar also in brick, but with more glass where the faculty apartments going to be. So by breaking down the scale, building these series of uh, essentially sliding bars, we could actually make the building seem thinner than it actually was to work within the conditions of the site. Here is then the view on the brick side looking out, and that has views over to the Washington Monument. Um, the public level, though, is effectively designed to maximize sight lines. And you can see these in the red, which when you enter in, you can see not only all the way through that building and that access, but from this vantage point, you maintain control of nearly the entire first floor. When you move to here, you get the same kind of control. So the building essentially uses modern ideas of kind of openness to be able to maximize the view, which is really organized to serve the deaf. There's particular community here. This is the inter interior view. So as you come into the space, you see the open lobby. But more importantly, coming down the very large ramp, you see a series of niches that are built off of it. And the niches are critical, so you can still have private conversations within a broader public space, so no one can eavesdrop onto you. Um, more importantly, this room then becomes the very large, effectively the living room for the campus, doubling as a large movie and lecture hall, where not only can everyone see the speaker, but the speaker can see them. Um, so that this dialogue that is absolutely critical uh, within deaf communication reorchestrates the spatial condition and the terracing so that you maximize sight lines of the orchestration of this primary space. From the other side, uh, looking down, you can see it as more, uh, more smaller areas for the groups or the large areas and then uh, in moments of applause. Windows used so that rooms are never isolated. Uh, the communication is uh, uh, explored. Large double, uh, essentially double hung garage doors so that you can maximize interior and exterior. So for this collab, uh, maximizing interior and exterior for communica visual communication at the same time making a big open space uh, for maximum utility with through a series of sliding panels can be broken into a series of individual uh, eight, eight or nine individual seminar rooms, um, all relatively quickly transformable to, to, to allow this space to do as many things as possible, not just be a, a single function. For the residence halls up above, the key was, again, sight lines, and sight lines at the moment of circulation, right? So instead of isolated floors where everyone goes and disappears, we said, felt it was critical to have a main, essentially organizing staircase that stretched not only all through all four floors, but had gaps between them. So, you, so if you are on the top floor, you can have communication all the way down the series of lobbies set off from us here. Um, those are connected to very large hallways. The hallways are about eight feet with niches, uh, measuring about you know, close to over eight, uh, probably 12 feet door to door. Um, so as you're getting really large hallways because if you've got two people walking and another one coming, you don't want to have to negotiate around uh, individuals uh, as, as they uh, stroll and communicate. 
within the heart of the lounge, though, is a, is a kitchen. And the kitchen's key, um, because this is where uh, the, each of the floors were to come together to cook. Um, but when you design a kitchen for the deaf, everything has to be based upon an island. You can't design something where you're putting uh, essentially a stove or a sink to the outside, because then your back is to the conversation, and you can't be part of, of, of the meal being made. So everything had to be organized around this one island, from sink to cooktop to dish, um, with only the microwave put, put off to the other side, so that this becomes essentially the hub, the organizing principle. Um, in some ways, it's not that different than a well-designed kitchen, but what it's doing, and this is for us what was most important from this project, was learning from the deaf not how to accommodate uh, deaf disabilities, but actually see the deaf's experience in the world as challenging our conventional understandings of efficiency to really now maximize social interaction, which is predicated upon the visual communication that is embedded in uh, American Sign Language. Um, here, another shot of the corridors with the niches pulled off um, so that you can be part of different communities, community of the corridor or of the different suites. Uh, views of the staircase with a continual unifying uh, wall that is also illumination wrapping all the way across, bringing you to the view out to the quad uh, as a kind of key condition of the joint between the public space uh, and the private space. And that was a particularly, uh, for us, a really interesting project because there the question of the social was put absolutely forward by the client. That, and, it, and, and for a client that was very self-conscious of the need to have those buildings build community and a community that was unique because of uh, their ability to communicate through sign language. Um, this one was a very different um, uh, client base from the standpoint that it was for the, Claremont, the administrators of the Claremont University consortiums. And the consortium is all the liberal arts colleges built around uh, Claremont. Claremont, McKenna, Pomona, Harvey Mudd Scripps, there's a whole series of them. Um, and the question of community and social relationship was really about the administrators. They had been atomized and broken into a whole series of different facilities uh, that were from uh, campus safety to real estate to facilities to centralized facilities all the way across campus. And they wanted one centralized facility, but our challenge was to make the centralized facility a icon of what Claremont stood for, a spectacular place to work if you are doing budget, healthcare, and other kinds of enrollment. But the building looks like this, right? It's a warehouse facility roughly about a football field long that had outgrown pretty quickly its services. They were no longer using it for the plumbing shop and the painting shop. So our job was to make this the place for the vice president um, and all of the administrators to really see as their work home. Um, to turn was effectively a super long tilt up warehouse building into a home that could also serve as a conference center mediating some of the questions between town and gown. This is the, what the building looks like. So your challenge, imagine your studio project, is that you're expected to turn this into an image the best of for a, for a university campus, right? And do it on budget. Um, with it, yet keep most of what this is, because they just built this a couple years ago. So they have to keep a lot of it. So our challenge was to figure out, well, how do we screen it? You can't take it down. How do we reskin the building, transform it by essentially uh, thickening the relationship between inside and outside to maximize the, 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 the opportunity that this building denies, which is in, in Southern California, right, where the sun is spectacular, the weather is always spectacular. You don't want double hung punch windows. You actually want a kind of interior exterior world that the shed doesn't really ever allow. Um, that was our rendering, and this is the building as built. Um, with these screens that then folds back around. So this one device not only cloaks the building, but also creates interior, exterior shading spaces uh, for uh, extended uh, conversations, lunch, uh, work, uh, work uh, more informal workspaces. As it pulls around at night, becomes the illuminated sign for the building with embedded linear LEDs um, that turns the entrance from looking like this into an entrance that extends through simply a screen, extends that threshold marking it to the outside as a bench, extending it from the bench into the inside so that the very same material, the wood becomes the welcome desk, carries on across that same surface, carries back around, becomes a series of banquettes for the kitchenette and the kitchen facilities so that that one device, what we're trying to do as many things as possible, maximizing its utility, but also providing a really clear sense of orchestration of how to transform this existing building. Um, and ultimately becoming this kind of slat that mediates interior and exterior. 
On the other side, uh, we carried that same piece to be able to provide a outdoor terrace. This one's facing south, so it has a solar shade, but at night can become the place for those incredible you know, events and parties that you want to have when the weather's really spectacular. And this is, these, these are all the employees, and when, for us, when it was really great with the opening night, the security guards literally had to get people who worked there nine to six, nine to seven, uh, try to get them to get out of the door because they didn't want to leave. Um, and that for us is a real, you know, if you can succeed, that's, that's a sign of success. Um, the inside, though, had other challenges. Namely, um, a little hard to get access to daylight um, in this really big moment, tilt-up, steel-framed building. Um, so what we did was end up putting in, uh, taking advantage of where we knew we were going to have existing utilities, um, places that, that you don't necessarily want daylight. Um, uh, uh, seminar spaces, meeting spaces, and obviously bathrooms. Um, and now saw that, saw that this had, had its own challenge, which is if you put an object in there, how do you, how do you make that a point of delight? So we were working with an artist who essentially made 7,000 individual motion sensor triggered LEDs to build a, effectively an LED grid uh, that uh, what we call the LED garden. That as you walk past this, uh, down here, all of these lights change color. And they change color following you as you move around this one figure. Um, so that you know, so that essentially the building welcomes you, acknowledges your presence, and, uh, and recognizes that this piece without light is now animated by LED light. And that wraps all the way around. In the main space, um, you've got the obvious challenge of this. Right? You're going to have to heat and cool it, electrical fire protection. Um, so we knew we couldn't just drop a ceiling. So we had to reinvent the idea of what a drop ceiling is. Uh, and we did that by essentially making uh, uh, 1,500 individual uh, MDF with a recycled Coke bottle plastic felt on the outside for acoustical purposes, hung them uh, using essentially a, uh, a digital model to X, Y, and Z each point, so they each hung, uh, put up by essentially a stage, uh, someone who works in Hollywood, so that you could turn these things into a new cloud-like ceiling working with wherever the ducts need to go, but now producing a complete, uh, essentially, canopy over this very large space. More importantly, we put in about 168 solar tubes, essentially punches into the ceiling, so that as the lights move across, clouds move across, anyone in this space has a sense of the daylight. So here is the morning, the light moves across, uh, it's going through the solar tubes, and then the electric lights start coming on as it starts getting darker, mediating between daylight and light, so that even though you're working during the day, you always have a sense of being in an outdoor condition because of the quality uh, of the ceiling canopy. Um, in the middle, uh, where we knew there was going to be a very large electric vault, we built an amphitheater, essentially a seating space that could be more informal or can double as a very large uh, performance area. Um, so it changes over the course of the day from a quick seat to the place where um, you can have large presentations to the administrators, to public events, in this case, a choral concert. Um, the office spaces, though, uh, were set up so that they're very open. They're, they're, uh, and as a result, the acoustical properties of the ceiling has, becomes a, a paramount condition and of the carpet. Um, and for us, what's really interesting is that this entire project, very much like we end up de designing it, was entirely built of lines. There's almost no solid wall. with a, with the very limited instances being that which encloses the bathroom. For the most part, it's all about the, the buildup of the repetitive lines, the drawing line that we use now inscribed so that if you look down the line, it opens up. You look across it, it becomes a solid. So it's this ability to use an aggregation of materials that has transformable relationships depending on how your eye is looking across it. Um, that allows us to be able to actually open up this building, change its look, but at the same time produce what we thought was a contemporary uh, administrative center. Um, the last two projects I'm going to show uh, deal with a slightly different condition, a, a challenge, which is coming about through, through climate change. Um, and, and this one is a, was a, more tri a more, I guess you would say, speculative project uh, driven uh, in which its uh, capacity is really carried about through the quality of the representation or the, or the drawings. And this is for the uh, Museum of Modern Arts, uh, waterproofing ground, uh, in which five architects or firms were hired to look at five different areas of the New York Harbor on the premise of what's going to happen with climate uh, change when water level rises 
uh, really start challenging New York City and New Jersey's ability to continue to function as a, a viable city. All right, this is in 2010, so uh, a couple years before Sandy. Um, the site we were asked to look at um, is this one, which is in New Jersey. Um, and it is the home to a number of monuments, some of them uh, pretty uh, uh, well known, Ellis Island, Liberty Island, uh, the Central Railroad of New Jersey where most of the immigrants from Ellis Island went to be able to go into to the rest of America. Uh, it also includes other monuments, the New Jersey Turnpike, the Liberty Science Center, uh, Education and Environmental Center, and, and some other things. And, but for us, what was, what was really the interesting point was not necessarily these monuments, which is what we thought we were going to be looking at at the beginning, because we realized in that case they either have to lift them to deal with uh, water or they have to, have to wall them up. You know, it's, it's really a technical challenge. For us, what was more interesting was this, this area back here, uh, which is Liberty State Park, which looks like that, right? It is essentially a cordoned off uh, uh, brownfield site that needs to be remedi remediated. Uh, Divorce from nearly a lot of activity. You can't get to it, to the majority of it. Um, and it's closer to uh, Wall Street than Central Park is to Wall Street, right? And its size is about the size of Central Park. Um, the reason this exists is that it didn't exist. It didn't exist over 150 years ago. This was an estuarial flat full of oysters that only over the course of providing the joint between shipping and rails did they fill it in just high enough to be above water level, but then filled in from the dredge from boats. Um, so it actually has uh, an incredible number of plants from around the world, uh, not just indigenous species. Um, so, w w w one of the, so if you look at this site, built just to be able to mediate uh, land and water already, all constructed through effectively infill, um, if you take just a really super conservative two foot rise, 68% of this is going to be underwater at high tide. Right? If you do a more logical one, which is you anticipate the melting of the polar ice caps, what's that going to do for water? You're looking at an 80% inundation um, and at 100-year floods now coming every 15 years. Um, so they should start renaming them 15-year floods. Uh, you're at 8 feet, 95% of it's underwater. So the real challenge here is what do you do? Right? This is very different than the, than the monuments which you need to protect. This area is really an open question. And more importantly, it's a more typical question for what's happening around the world where you have uh, mediations between land and water that are not monumental, but ordinary. So this is where we focused our attention on. And we said, well, one of the challenges of this site is that it is built through a kind of hard infrastructure. It's an either or condition. Either it's going to be keep the water out or it's going to fail. Right? And that, that didn't seem to be a productive way of thinking about it. So in d working, designing through section, cutting and filling with the existing land that we had, we felt that we could actually carve new fingers into here, bring, bringing the land up higher, dropping it down lower, but producing a section that is much more gradiated so that it can take different terrains, can take different tidal conditions, um, cutting it in a series of cross grains. The reason being is that it, if you maximize the coastline, you get at low tide 45 miles of coast, at high tide 35 miles of coast, whereas the existing coastline is less than five miles. The benefit to this is not only you get more uh, areas for natural inhabitation of uh, plants, uh, fish, animals, but you also have the capacity to absorb some of the energy of the storm surges. The more coastline, more ability to absorb that energy. Um, so as a driving condition, we also felt that we needed to provide anchor points to be able to activate this as a new productive park. All right, there's nothing to hold on to. There's no, nothing sacred in this because it was all constructed for other purposes. The purposes no longer exist of shipping and, and train. So instead, we felt it was important to be able to produce all kinds of new kinds of park, a park that is both a research and development for aquaculture, one that's dealing with amphitheaters and recreation, water lodge dealing with tourism, and the regional produce market dealing with uh, essentially the extension connection between uh, New Jersey farmlands and the populace of New York City and uh, New Jersey. So in this case, we sort of overlapped a kind of loose program series of program areas dealing with the possibilities of park in the expanded sense of the term park, not just the pastoral understanding of the park, reinscribing it so that you would then represent it. One of the real challenges, though, is that you had to capture the attention of visitors to MoMA 
who you were competing with Picassos for their attention in the two hours they have at, at MoMA and get them to understand all of that, which took way longer than two minutes to explain to you. Right? So what we felt was absolutely critical was to have a model in the middle that we would see and see of the topography and the bathometry of the site and then project onto it through a roof mounted projector the duration of tidal conditions as it would transform that new sculpted landscape and then a series of vignettes that would give you a sense of what this might be as a new productive park as a series of perspectival conditions, both aerial and in detail within the layout. So this is then the model with the projection on it. You can see the pixels. This is then physical model. So taken from a kind of aerial view, you could show very quickly from low tide going up to uh, high tide to a 100-year flood to catastrophic storm surge, what what this would mean in terms of the changing landscape even over the course of a day. Right? So that this capacity to understand and the uh, mediation between the digital and the physical uh, becomes a kind of active part of the presentation and, uh, the, and, and the viewing of the piece. More importantly, we did a series of aerial views, in this case the Aquacultural Research Center, from above, a, a building that would literally float with the tide while at the same time testing possibilities for different fish uh, and different uh, plant life but also the perspective from down below. So a sense of what would happen if you thought about a new relationship between land and water, not just a hard edge uh, in, uh, engineered opposition. In this case, a amphitheater in which the stage would be located um, on the water so spring scheme could literally float in. Um, and a series of camping barges so you could actually rent a camping barge for an entire Lollapalooza weekend. Um, and then a series of tidal pools that would fill in so we tried to do as many things that if you look closely, you'd be able, to be able to understand the kind of inscription of social life we anticipated within this park. This is also, the currently Liberty State Park is used for these large festivals. So uh, I was trying to take advantage of the existing conditions. Um, and then what it would be like to be able to have uh, that waterway returned with a series of riprap uh, on the site, essentially a constructed uh, relationship between land and water. Um, in this case, the water lodge, in which all the rooms have water views. Um, but then the extension of a series of landscapes into pools that would then be flooding pools. So you'd anticipate the use to be able to be activated by the very changing tides, not just antithetical to it. Um, and then down from the other side, really turn the New York waterfront into what it really is, a waterfront um, that often is denied by the very fact that the city turned it back uh, in the 19th and 20th century to, to the water because of the uh, qual quality and nature of shipping itself. Um, and in this case, the Central Railroad in New Jersey by redirecting a light rail can now become a hub uh, for not only the selling of a, farm, a very large farmer's market, but also reactivation of this historic building um, and turning it into a research site so that you could really test one of the challenges to global, uh, the, to, to the globe over rising water levels, which is increased salinization of soil and farmland. This is gonna have massive impact upon our ability to feed the amount of people in this world because so much of the farmland is uh, uh, at low, low water levels that will not be able to deal with increased salinization of water surface. Um, so we saw each of these strips as different testing grounds uh, for dealing with different levels of salinization in the tidal flood, while at the same time making that relationship between the land and New York City. Right. And this would be then the proposed, compared to the hard edge one, the proposed new uh, construction. Um, little do we know that uh, about two and a half years later, this happened. This is, a, this is Sandy, um, so, and that was our site. Right. Sandy went straight there. Right. So we got ca a call about a um, month and a half, two months after Sandy from the mayor's office um, and asked us if we wanted to be part of a, a joint project between New York City Parks, Department of Design and Construction, um, to, and McLaren is the engineering group, Garrison Architects, LPL, Matthews Nielsen, and Sage Coombs Architects, to reopen the beaches by Memorial Day um, after Sandy hit. Um, we were asked to look at Coney Island. Um, not just Coney Island itself, but the uh, Steeplechase Pier, which in this case is a historic photograph that doesn't show the extent of what it really is, which is, is one of the largest boardwalks, certainly on the East Coast, that extends as a pier into the water. Right? It was originally built for a very different purpose than it currently has. Um, its legacy was that the steeplechase amusement park was here and that they would literally bring ships, steamships from Manhattan and elsewhere, drop them off 
And this was paid for by the amusement park as a way of drawing um, essentially visitors to come straight to their amusement park. Right? But it's now a, a, a relic, still there, looking like this, and then after Sandy, not in the same shape. Um, pretty well taken apart, as you can see here, by essentially a surge of tides coming across to the side. Um, this is a shot a couple hours before the, the highest point uh, when Sandy hit. Um, the deck completely ripped. Uh, the, uh, the fact that they had anchored uh, all of the wood uh, uh, joists to the concrete meant that the entire thing was ripped and the concrete started being used uh, by, the, by the deck as a massive wave sail to batter uh, the, the, the pile cap. Um, as you can see from these shots, uh, essentially pulling it all the way off. The interesting thing, though, uh, uh, for us was twofold. One, uh, that this was an icon that was essentially not designed as a pleasure icon. It was simply a utilitarian way to get from steamship to the amusement park. That now the amusement park is now no longer there. This is now a destination. Right? The Steeple J Fair is a destination people go to. They go to to fish. They go to illegally dive off, which you're not supposed to do, to, to wander around. But it's not spectacularly well designed. I mean. The benches are pretty unpleasant. Uh, it's just flat. You go out there and you come back. Um, the other issue is we had one week to design this, three weeks to do seating. It's three football fields long. And we had to do something new. Right? So what we did was to say, basically, we are going to provide a rethinking of this, keeping the thing that made it interesting was, was its extensive horizontality out into the water, while at the same time changing the things that were never designed in the first place, namely the benches, points of destination, fishing, the ability to use it in multivalent ways by inserting a series of discrete pieces that we could design in a week and detail uh, within them because they were going to build it um, starting in roughly March and open it uh, by Memorial Day. Um, first thing we did was look at a structural system which we separated out the deck as a sacrificial layer, so when the next storm comes, the deck will literally just be taken off and will not destroy the more expensive thing to fix, which is the pile cap. Um, introducing the benches so they're not up against the side, so you can't use them for jumping anymore, but also you can now look out into the water, whereas before you could, or you can look at, watch people as they're coming around, so it's essentially a double-sided bench. Um, and at the end, producing a new crossing, essentially a heightened moment of threshold where as you move out to here, you get a raised porch so that you could literally have that kind of titanic moment of being out, looking out over the horizon, right? Uh, out over the Atlantic, probably the inverse of the Titanic because you're looking back the other way. Um, and at the same time, provide a screen screening device here that would provide shade, particularly for those that would come out here a series of drop downs that would drop you down into the water, a series of holes that you could view in the water. So really trying to maximize that relationship of view to water with as limited number of means as possible. Um, so this is in the process of it. Uh, they were taking out part of the deck. Um, everything was going really well. Um, and then this happened. Um, the ship that was being used to fix the pile caps sank and became a battering ram to take out more of the pier. So, our ability to make the Memorial Day deadline slipped rather quickly. Um, uh, when you have this now as your brute hammer destroying the thing that was left. Um, they fixed that, went back to it. So you can see here, these are the concrete pieces. They're anchored to the concrete within a series of sacrificial layers, starting with uh, the essentially uh, recycled plasticized lumber, not using tropical hardwoods. Um, and then more RPL on the top deck so that this is essentially the layer that can go. Easy to put down once it comes up, assuming it will come down. Um, more importantly, you can see just the extent of this, the sort of incredible length of this piece, um, producing this kind of effect when finally opened. Um, uh, and for us, what's fascinating is to be able to come back and see how many different uses for bike riding, uh, for uh, meandering, for doing, you know, using it in the way in which we thought it would be used, as a place for sitting, uh, a place for watching birds, that's my son. Um, uh, uh, but also the capacity to be able to see how these things um, and this new wave bench that we put in so that you could actually have a place where you can hang out, you can get a suntan, um, you could sort of walk up and down, um, you can lay out, 
Um, you don't have a job, which is why they have a beard. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, you know, essentially, so you can have this kind of, you know, this moment of sort of delight and spectacle um, within, within it, sort of amplifying the existing conditions, not, but, but through tactical insertions that would still keep the, the actual function, which is the length of it. So uh, you can see the delight in the kid's face. As you walk through back to the back, these, these screening devices, we realized, would now be seen by airplanes landing in the LaGuardia. So if you land in the LaGuardia, what you'll see is Coney Island written so that when the sun comes down, it casts a shadow onto the ground that effectively tattoos the ground with the sign of Coney Island. Um, so that you're using the screening device now as an icon for, the, uh, for anyone. It's, it's reversed if you're looking at it from below, but it's right if you're looking at it from the sun or from an airplane. Um, so Coney on one, Island on the other. Uh, here's the island side. The, the, the uh, incredible length of um, guardrails we had to reconfigure, and we did so with a really simple device. This is just aluminum tube into an aluminum angle that was welded, but just simply adjusting the angle of that one piece, you can get a completely different effect of that one surface as it reflects the reflection off of the light. Um, so that one component uh, isn't just straight up and down, it's intentionally angled, working within the limits of the four inch ball rule, but at the same time, uh, producing them to be produced really quickly, cost effectively, but not be, uh, but still reflect the kind of unique conditions of where this, uh, where this uh, edge was. Um, looking out to the end then, this is the sort of opportunity to be able to get out up above. You can see someone taking photographs as, in, uh, as we had thought they would. You want to be able to get above so you're no longer seeing the horizon deck, because while this has to be uh, at guardrail height, this does not. This can be handrail height because you have a 30 inch ball that's broken by that seat. Um, so that by using code, we could actually reduce the amount of obstruction to create the effect that you desired within the, the pier, which is to be able to be out into the landscape, out into the water uh, to the extent possible, which is ultimately uh, the goal of the steeplechase pier. So you get these sort of moments uh, for us, which are, are pretty fascinating. And what we think is really extraordinary about architecture in multiple ways, whether it's speculation, whether it's installation, to really understand how it can transform human inhabitations, create things you hadn't anticipated, um, but to also create something that at one le level is incredibly long. Its power comes from its repetitive nature, its relationship to the site, but it's also its power comes from the individual relationships that are inhabited within that, and how architecture can mediate between the broader environment and the social environment that's constructed through the orchestration of material, light, and means. So thank you very much. Yes, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm happy to take questions as well. If that, yes. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a really good question. Um, the best way I can uh, answer it is to say that we, we, we don't start by designing. We start by looking carefully at what are, the, what are the issues at stake? What is going to be the thing that's going to beat us over the head if we don't deal with it up front? Uh, you know, in each uh, the CUC project, how you turn the shed into something else? How do you, you know, you got to deal with it. So you start with the givens, and then you figure out instead of how do I push the givens aside, actually, how do we make that thing the very thing that has to generate the inventive idea, all right? And it's unique depending on which project. The other is a process in which the three of us are, tend to work collaboratively around a table. Uh, often the bad pun or the bad joke becomes the generator for the good idea. Um, so that you end up leaving it open as opposed to sitting in a room sketching the perfect thing and handing it to someone and say, make this. Because uh, that doesn't, it's not really a collaborative, open, inventive, creative way of doing it. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of uh, iterative studies that are done. You know, what, rather than designing the perfect idea, we tend to say, do 10. You know? Generate 10 ideas. And then, well, whoa, oh, that's interesting. Well, let's take that one. That one seems to go in interesting ways we hadn't thought about. Do 10 more based upon that. So it's an iterative process. It's not just spinning your wheels, but it's really testing so you're not feeling like when you're designing it, it has to be perfect the first time, because it never will be. So don't try. Right? 
So it's be much better to design through a kind of what-if strategy that gives you a point where you're a player as opposed to something where you're responsible. Um, because in the end, you will have to be responsible, but you do through, through much more pleasure and delight. I hope that answers. But with the production side of architecture and design really being super digital, and even a lot of what you guys do kind of diving into that, whether it's scripting or looking at some of that, how does the like hand drawing, sketching, and the analog process kind of inform the digital side of things? Uh, it's uh, increasingly easier to do that. I mean, uh, I'd say 15 years ago, the translation between digital and hand was m a, s a scanner, right? You, there was a kind of you know, scanner in Photoshop. Increasingly, what we're working on is you know, tablets and laptops that allows you to immediately work straight onto the files that then translates that back. Um, so that the, when you get into, say, CDs and production, that production is really a kind of play back and forth between the accuracy but the slowness, perhaps, of the digital technology, most of it right now is, is Revit-based for us, um, and the speed and inaccuracy of the hand. And you want to use each for what they're good at. Right? It doesn't make sense spending hours and hours making the perfect model of a quick study. Right? You, want to, you want to tease out things and, and think about the time as the, as the real constraint. Um, on the other hand, uh, each person in the office has different skill levels. Um, I, I spend, just simply because of the nature of the work, more time on email and hand drawing than I do have the privilege of, of sitting and you know, coordinating uh, sets. And that's just the way in which uh, offices are structured to maximize who has time, where are they at, and how can they uh, take advantage of their skills. We only look at GPA and SATs. <laughs> um, I, I, I wish that was the case. That would make it a lot easier. Um, there, there, we're, all three of us teach. Um, and a lot of the people that work in our office are people that were our students. Um, and the reason being is that a lot of, we're a relatively small office. And so the social dimension, who works well, who, who collaborates well, who's willing to uh, you know, make a model of this and run to that store to get its part and sit down, meet with a client all within an hour is critical. So it's, the, it's a balance between skills, character, you know, what works with the ESO ethos of the office. Um, so, and that's, that's things to recognize is that, you know, your skills as an architect are, have to be multivalent. You have to be able to present, you have to be able to draw, you have to be able to communicate as well as be a really good designer uh, have to be able to write well to be able to increasingly, you know, you're asked to work on an RFP, or do a proposal or a qualification. So oftentimes what we're looking for is not single skills, but a range of things that, um, that can balance and complement the broader range of things that architects are asked to do now. It's not, it's very different than say a, a hierarchically driven large office, which may have different areas. Um, we tend to want people in the office that can do as many things as possible. So that's also what we're looking for. Um, different, but you, you, as you're in a more general question, as you're looking for an office, try to figure out how they're organized and see whether it's a good fit to where you want to do or where you want to go in terms of what you're doing. Um, there's, no, there's no set answer. Um, there's no given solution. And often what it comes down to is interpersonal relationships. Yeah, yeah it's a, uh, the issue of diagramming, I, I, would, I would more broadly say there are two different types of diagrams. Um, one is the diagram to communicate to the client or to the public the idea of the project after maybe it has been fully designed. In other words, you are or in the process of getting approval for design, where you are doing a diagram to explain decisions that then make inevitable the design that's being presented as the result of that set of, of criteria. In other words, the diagram becomes a way of, um, of, uh, of framing 
the project or framing the problem of which the inevitable end must be the presentation, the design that we're giving you. The other diagram that I argue is more quick testing, one that is informative and self-reflexive. And that's usually done as relatively quick diagrams where we're trying to say, well, what is the salient condition of this project, often done as a hand sketch or as a series of diagrammatic studies that are testing the design, not purely about their ability to distill and communicate to someone else, right? So they may be really un, not fully formed, gestural, uh, something that needs to be explained with someone else through words, whereas the other one should stand alone, right? And it's important to recognize that those are two very different types of diagrams and that perfecting the diagram in the process of the design process may shut down your design because your building can never live up to the diagram. You have to be very self-conscious of the relationship between your diagram and your design process and the diagram as a presentation tool to be able to communicate to someone else something that you've already answered. I wish I could say no to that, but um, it, it, budget is the, one of the constraints and increasingly the constraint that you look at first. Um, not to limit what you do, but to make it much more uh, focused. Uh, in almost every one of our projects, uh, we try to avoid the over budget redesign process because, well, architectural fees can't un allow that. You don't have enough time, but you contractually opt contractually obligated to provide a project on budget. Um, so what we start with is really looking at budget as a substantial constraint that then sets the conditions by which you work, which often makes the project better because it, you have to be more creative with less expensive materials. And I would actually argue that if you look through the course of the history of architecture, architects' biggest budget projects are not necessarily their best, right? In fact, Architects who continually have budgets that run two to three times over may not be the best architects because they don't have that resistance that forces them to do something that, they, that, that, that raises other opportunities, right? So budget is really, it's not a constraint that puts you in a, sh in a straitjacket that says, oh, I can't do a design. Um, what it really is, is is a framework by which you're, you're asked to operate and therefore be more creative. Um, so some of our projects have had budgets uh, in, when we started the firm of, of $40,000, um, which is not a lot when you're talking about, it's not even enough to do a garage, um, but we're supposed to do an entire interior renovation. So it changes the material conditions that you work on. So budget is something, you know, I, if anything, do not equate big budget equals great project, all right? It's really how you approach budget and the response to it that sets the condition for whether the budget is something that holds you back or something that, you, that catalyzes the work. We, we see it as great architecture does not equal great budgets. Although on the other hand, you get paid a lot more on bigger budget projects. <laughs> the fee-based world. Achieving many solutions kind of alleviate some of those budgetary restrictions? Well, well, you it, or, or, it's it's absolutely, you're extending resources. In other words, if you only have a certain amount of budget and you're supposed to do two spaces and you can only afford one, how do you make that one space do two things? So yeah, it, it, that also for us ties back to issues of, uh, of smart with environmental resources. In other words, instead of building excessively, build to do something that can be used all the time much better than having a spectacular space that's only used, say, 10 times a year at, you know, Saturday afternoon. Yeah. What helped you to anticipate the future trends or the changes? And how do you do to look ahead instead of being, you know? Like it's, that's, that's a larger, that's a larger, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I'm not sure I have an answer for you. I think one of the things um, that is changing is technology, uh, and that impacts us most explicitly in terms of timetables. Um, projects are getting tighter and tighter in terms of their timetable, 
which is impacting our ability to spend more time on design because you're supposed to, with the tools, you can have fewer people doing things faster with shorter time with lower budgets, which is good for the client but maybe not good for the architectural process. So I would say that's one of the real challenges out there. On the other hand, you can creatively engage a broader range of work, namely pushing up against what has historically been the role of the contractor by controlling more of the production process to the very tools that he uses to design. So that's where, that's, if anything about the issue of futurology, it's less about style, it's more about what are the methods and constraints by which work is to be done so that you can creatively stay on top and economically stay afloat. Um, That's one. one. I mean, we, we have, have one in the office. office. We've laser cutter. We have three three axis milling machine. We use it mostly to convince clients that we know how to use it. Um, <laughs> uh, it it's useful. It's a tool, but it's not. Uh, it doesn't. It, the, you know, the idea of the radical transformation. You know, this is going to completely change the world. No, it re it does what I call remediation. It changes what things came from before, but it doesn't necessarily produce the radical new. All right. Anything that's new is always built upon the knowledge of what it was before as its interpretation at the same time interprets or reinterprets a thing from the past into something that it wasn't. All right. So it's both and at the same time. It's both pushing to the future and recalibrating what you know now as you carry forward into some other tomorrow. You're given such a small time frame in which to build, so I was wondering what that would kind of look like organizationally for your firm. Like when you're given a sign like that, like how, where the tech kind of people come together, like how many, and what does that look like? Well, if you're looking you look at just the architectural team, the LTL, um, a, a large project will be uh, five, six uh, people working on it production wise with the three partners. Small project will be one, maybe two. Now, Coney Island, it, at one point, I think we had four people working on it, so three principles. But in this case, we were, uh, you know, this design was really fast, presentation was really fast, execution of drawings was really fast, and then we had to make sure that it was carried out into the field. Uh, we tend to not, we haven't had projects where we have teams of 20. Um, so it's also, the na we're 14, so we try to have uh, everyone working from the same project from the beginning all the way to the end carrying through with continuity so that the person responsible for the sketch is also then knowing why it was done that way when they're in the field talking to the contractor. So we, sp we try to right size. It's also right sizing to the, to the fee, right sizing to um, the, the, the nature of the consultants and if we're working with another architect as an architect of record or in partnership that changes as well. Well, thank you very much. Great, thank you all. Thanks.